Good morning, friends. I welcome you to Veldtevreden's English service and thank you for being part of our service. I know it is difficult times we live in. The lockdown is continuing and the infection rate is still climbing and we can easily become discouraged, but we are gathered in the mighty name of God. As Psalm 124 verse 8 reminds us, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I greet you in the name of the life-giving God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I greet you with his love and his peace. And I, I invite you to join in praise and worship with our mu music team uh, singing the desert song. Let us pray together. Praise be to you, O Lord, for life and for my intense desire to live. Praise be to you for the mystery of love 
and for my intense desire to be a lover. And praise be to you for this day and another chance to live and to love. Thank you, Lord, for friends who stake their claim in my heart and for enemies who disturb my soul and bump my ego, for tuba players and storytellers. Thank you, Lord, for singers of song and for teachers of song who help me to sing along the way and for listeners. And thank you, Lord, for those attempt, who attempt beauty rather than curse ugliness, for those who take stands rather than take poles, for those who risk being right rather than ponder to be liked, and for those who do something rather than talk about everything. And Lord, grant me and us the grace then and a portion of your spirit that we may so live as to give others cause to be thankful for us. Thankful because you have not forgotten how to hope and how to laugh and how to say, I'm sorry and how to forgive and to bind up the wounds and how to dream, how to cry, cry and how to pray, how to love when it is hard and how to dare when it is dangerous. Undare me, Lord, that praise may flow more easily from me than once and thanks more readily than complaints. Praise be to you, Lord, for life. Praise be to you for another chance to live. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 18, the first nine verses. It is the parable of the persistent widow. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God or cared what the people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. And for some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because the widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he be putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? on the earth. Dear friends, there are many quotations about prayer. Uh, some are on the lighter size, side, like, and they may brighten your day. Uh, Alan Bartlett, who said, seven days without a prayer makes one week. And the Sunday school teacher who asked the class, what is prayer? And the student answered, that is the message sent to God at night and on Sundays when the rates are lower. But on the other side, um, somebody asked me years ago, do you believe in the power of prayer? Would anyone answer in the negative? My answer was yes. But then he asked me the second question, then why do you spend so little time in prayer? Ouch, <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. And are you struggling with that aspect of prayer as well? Richard Trench's words are comforting. Prayer are not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of his highest willingness. And isn't this what Jesus is trying to say to his disciples? In the text of today, he said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God or cared what the people thought. Jesus tells a parable that addresses two concerns. Firstly, he intends the disciples should pray always in the first verse. 
And earlier in the Gospel of Luke, he already given his disciples instruction on prayer in what we now know as the Lord's Prayer, which focuses on prayer as asking from God. Prayer is putting oneself in a state of dependence that relies on the gifts of God for life in this world. And Jesus assured us the Heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And the theologian Karl Barth said that prayer is indeed simply asking. Jesus tells his disciples the story in Luke 18 so that they do not lose heart or give up. And that is so that they do not become discouraged and quit hoping. And this parable ex exhibits the relentlessness of refusing a no answer and to resolve to continue ask from the Lord. And Jesus is urging his followers that the very act of prayer is a way to remain courageous, a way to resist resignation that would result in, in losing heart. And the antidote for such defeat is the act of prayer. So prayer is an instrumental purpose. And in this introduction, Jesus does not assure the disciples that prayer are, are answered, but only that the act of prayer is in itself an act of resistance against discouragement and defeat. The parable exhibits the relentlessness of not quitting. And thus, Jesus established a direct connection between prayer and not losing heart. And the negative inference is that the disciples who do not always pray, and that is stayed, stayed linked to God in asking, will sooner or later just lose heart. The disciples do not have sufficient resources on their own to sustain a life of obedience, but instead depend on God's continuing gifts in response to continual asking in prayer. My dear friends, at the beginning of the lockdown, most of us thought that after the initial 21 days, life would ease back into the normal routine. Now it is already past 100 days, and although some restrictions have been lifted, the end of COVID-19 is nowhere in sight. In that sense, it is easy to lose heart and get discouraged. In this parable, Jesus is also talking to us in the year 2020. The main characters in this parable is the judge and the widow. And Jesus, as a master storyteller, quickly invites his listening disciples into a, a frightened interaction. The interaction could happen anywhere, in a certain town, even in Johannesburg. It features a judge and a widow. The judge is portrayed as a cynical uh, and indifferent person. He neither feared God or cared what people thought. Anything can happen in a parable. But we should not fail to notice that the parable permits the judge to be a stand-in for God, whom petitions must be addressed. And of course, a parable allows distance as well as identity, and we need not draw the connection of the judge and God too closely. Nevertheless, if we track the parable, we may have a glance at the God who some people think is indifferent and unresponsive. And the widow, on the other hand, is a recipient of injustice. Well, of course, she was. In a patriarchal society, widows are sure to be victimized because they have no male advocate. It is for this reason that the Old Testament repeatedly summons ancient Israel to care for widows along with orphans. The wid widow is resourceless. Again, we should notice the implied parallel. 
we should not fail to notice that the parable presents the widow as a stand-in for the disciples and for us. And in the rough of tumble of power, the disciples are like the widow, powerless and vulnerable. Thus the stage is set for a transaction between a cynical, indifferent judge on the one side and a resourceless widow who had been victimized. And the alert listener is free to compute this as a transaction between a God who has gifts to give, but who is indifferent about the need of his disciples, who depend on these gifts in a world full of need. And this interaction between the judge and the widow is not played on an even playground, but perhaps that is the point. The act of prayer is not between two equal partners but one between a God who is addressed and perhaps not responsive and the disciples who are needy and resourceless. And Jesus urges his disciples, stay active in this transaction, for staying active is to fend off despair. But the interaction between the imperious judge and the needle who a widow is in three parts. At first, the widow addresses the judge with an imperative, grant me justice. In the context of the story, this is a remarkable statement. No one would have expected a widow to speak up in court. No one would have thought the widow had justice on her, on her aim. A bid for justice constitutes a recognition that the courts have been stacked against her and she had been exploited. And in a patriarchal society, such exploration of a widow would have been business as usual, and she would have expected nothing other than that. But she does. She breaks the silence of conformity. She speaks out against the miscarriage of justice that would have seemed normal in her society. Indeed, we might imagine that some saw a bit as stupidity. She filed a case in court that called into question what was taken for normal. She breaks the silence and kept coming to the judge, speaking up repeatedly in court, perhaps regularly filing a new claim and making new charges. Uh, it is no wonder that she is properly labeled as importunate, a fancy work, term that means to nag. And we can imagine that every time she showed up at the court, the clerks would all have groaned because they knew that she wa what she wanted <laughs> and they knew how it would turn out. She filed claims always as Jesus urged his disciples to pray always. And secondly, the judge was unresponsive to her pleading. Verse 4 says, for a while he refused. Maybe it was a technical objection or that she followed the wrong steps to file a complaint, but she could not get an answer from the judge. And thirdly, the judge relents. Not because he wanted to do justice, but because the widow was relentless. And this all happened later. We are not told how much later, but it seemed to be a long time in coming. The judge confirms that he has no fear of God or any human respect for anyone but himself. And in verse 6, Jesus steps out of the parable to address his disciples, whom he has been instructing in prayer. His core message is, where God out in prayer. Where God out in prayer. This counsel is followed by two questions that with implied answers. Verse 7 says, And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? The answer is like the judges in America's got talent or Britain's got talent. They sometimes say it's a big fat yes, God will, because he is in the justice business and he listened to his chosen ones 
because he knows their pain and suffering. Will he keep putting them off? No. Will there be a long delay that consistent prayer is the medicine for not losing heart in the waiting room? But then the final question in verse 8. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The question is not about the Lord's second coming, but rather about finding faith. Faith is both the conviction that justice can be accomplished and the refusal to accept injustice. In that sense, Luke understands continual prayer not as simply passive waiting, but as an active quest for justice. If the widow had no faith, she would not have cried out and wouldn't have persisted in prayer. And the question comes to us as well. Where are we to break the silence over and what are we praying for? The virus has exposed a lot of injustices in South Africa. Schools without water, people without food or shelter or work, corruption and dom domestic violence. That list go on and on. Can we as church pray and work for a just society? And the parable is urging us to do so. We can also keep praying in many other ways. Henry Nouwen wrote in his book about spiritual direction, the following about prayer. Prayer is not being busy with God as opposed to being busy with someone else. Prayer is primarily a useless hour to be with God, not because I am so useless to God, but because I am not in control. If anything useful comes out of my prayer, it is God who does it. And over time, our time spent with God may become more fruitful, uh, but it is not our doing. The time set apart for prayer is our control but the results are not. God is not an unjust judge, and he will help us in his time, and the results are in his hands. And somebody said it in this way, even on the material level, God answers prayers in varied ways. He may change the situation about which we pray, as when he delivered Peter from prison, he may show us how to change the situation, as when Moses, complaining uh, of the defeat at Ai, was told to get off his knees and purify the people. God may leave the situation unchanged, but change us within it. And when we, as when he enabled Paul and Silas to sing through the darkness and pain of Philippi's prison. Or you may leave the situation to ourselves unchanged, but make plain his deeper purposes for our understanding, as when Paul was led most gladly to accept his thorn in the flesh. To pray always is to live a just life. Your life and prayer are not separated from each other. And Brother Lawrence reminded us that prayer is practicing the presence of God. Whether we are washing the dishes or doing our daily work, we are doing it by God's grace and for His glory. And Mother Teresa underlines that as well by saying, prayer enlarges the heart until it is capable of containing God's gift of Himself. Let us conclude by praying together with the Lord's Prayer as it is translated in the message. Father, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. Amen. Thank you for uh, supporting the congregation with your donations, we appreciate it so that we can do our work uh, as church in our society.
I invite you to, to sing Great Are You, Lord, with our music team. comes from God, and may he fill you with joy and peace because of your trust in him, and may you, your hope grow stronger by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> 